everyone. Welcome back to another episode of The Welcome Table. Today, we are joined by UCI Professor Willoughby Harrard, and she is an Associate Professor of African American Studies. Thank you so much for joining us, Tiffany. Oh, so happy to be here. Really glad Thank you all are doing this. Yeah, so before we get started with the interview, we usually do a little show and tell just to get the audience warmed up and just so they can get us uh, get to know us a little better. So we'll go first. Uh, this week, it's my turn and I brought a pair of my mom's old glasses. Um, she used to wear these while she was teaching. She was actually a college professor as well. And um, one of my favorite outfits that she would wear was her teaching outfit. So she would put on these glasses, she would have her hair all done, and then she would put on like her nice little pinstripe suit. And I just thought that she like looked so beautiful whenever she wore that outfit. And I don't know, whenever I saw her, I just thought she looked so powerful. And like, I thought, wow, you look like Xena the warrior princess. <laughs> like, oh my goodness. So yeah, whenever I saw her in that, I'm like, I wanna be like you. And that holds us true um, today. So that's what I brought this week. Um, what did you bring? So I, I just wanna ask you a hundred questions about your mom. Oh, of course, <laughs> yeah, shoot. <laughs> glasses and her power suit and how much you admired her that's super beautiful I brought a poem I'm a poet mm. and so I'm going to read my poem okay, okay. okay. awesome yeah. yes okay so it's called school news Mrs. Dorothy Mulkey versus the perverts in blue or stop calling the police that's the title of it I love that oh, yes I love that I'm already intrigued <laughs> If only I were as brave as Mrs. Mulkey, who fought her neighbors and her city and the state of California and the Supreme Court to stay, to not be evicted, to not be displaced. If only I were brave enough to ask the friendly young officers why they were talking to my 10 year old skateboarding child on his own block. I might ask, why do you drive on my street? Why do you cruise and lurk? Who can I call and tell and scream out to? Where is the list of state employed predators? Because I want to register something on a web database. The men in blue have come to watch my child growing up to stunt the life I'm trying to cultivate. Forcing me to be terrified and curtailing the movements of this reborn passport carrying new African here here are the lessons of fugitivity and marinage. Here are the lessons of campus climate and school boards and no place to hide, no refuge, no protection, just out here, exposed, available to be seen, skateboarding on your own block. I feel so very profoundly watched. If only I could ask Mrs. Mulkey's spirit to gather me up and teach me to organize my neighbors. Because I know this, somebody called the perverts in blue to gather and lurk and watch under the watchful eyes of my neighbors. The police came to troll on our block and pour out their leering, hateful, titillation-seeking, offensive eyes all over my son's bodies, sweat dripping down from helmets, kick flips and ollies, and mama, I got something to show you. They came, and in my house, my Irvine-raised children agreed that these were friendly young officers until they aren't anymore. Dang, mm -hmm. that was amazing. That was amazing. Wow. wow. We're like, wow. I know, I'm like, <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I'm. When did you write that? in 2018 in 2018 mm -hmm. yeah. wow and wow everything that you wrote down really holds true today so thank you so much for sharing that with us with your with our audience and yes thank you so much and that gets me even more amped to start asking you some questions we wanted to first begin with like <laughs> with um what inspired you to begin your teaching career mm -hmm. So I have these wonderful, wonderful people who I love, who made me want to become a professor and made me want to teach. So some of them are like 
people from way back in history. So there's this cat called Monroe Trotter, and he was a civil rights activist. And Monroe Trotter was one of the founders of public education in the United States for people, any people, like any people. This dude was like out there advocating that schools shouldn't just be like little private schools run by churches and Sunday schools. So he's somebody who comes to mind. But Monroe Trotter is also really exciting because um, he wanted to go to the treaty meeting that was happening at the end of World War I. And he knew as a black person, like even W.E.B. Du Bois was being denied a passport and a visa by the State Department because they didn't want any black people to go there and be like, they're lynching us, there's segregation happening. They didn't want any of that. And so he hired himself on as um, somebody working on a ship. And that's how he got to the meeting. Like he basically went undercover so he could be there at the Paris, uh, you know, Versailles treaty mm -hmm. meeting that mm -hmm. was going to end World War I because he was like, somebody needs to be there to speak up for Black people all mm -hmm. over the world. Right. And so there's something really inspiring to me about that kind of person who is smart enough to realize I might have to go undercover because we actually are in a battle and there's people who don't want us to be alive. And sometimes you gotta use the spook who sat by the door, kind of Sam Greenlee kind of response. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you have to be guarding your peace and preparing for war. Um, and so he's really inspiring. I'm also really inspired by this guy, Kasuhun Shakol. And Kasuhun Shakol is the founder of Africa World Press. So you probably have heard of ta Coates, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ta-Nehisi Coates has published all these books. He's a really famous journalist. He writes a lot. He's really well regarded. He was raised in the house by somebody like Kasuhun Shakol. He was raised up by a dad who back in the 60s and 70s decided, I'm going to start a publishing company and republish all the great books of Black writers from hundreds of years ago, Black classic press. And Kasuhun Shakol in New Jersey, you know, he's an East African immigrant, came to the U.S. in the 60s with like nothing in his pocket. And he said, there's all of these books that are out of print that I want to make sure can be taught on the African continent to school kids, to teachers, to researchers. And I got a chance to go and meet him several mm -hmm. years ago I was at a conference on the east coast and so I said Kasuhun can I come and talk to you and I knew Africa World Press mostly from catalogs like and from buying their books but I went to this like just downtown Newark spot and it was this massive warehouse and it was just bigger than our campus wall to wall to wall books that he had published hundreds and hundreds of thousands of books that he had published over the years. And he said this thing to me that like, talk about being inspired. He said, Tiffany, we've always been in the black. We've never been broke, not one year. He said, I started out selling my books at mosques, at Sunday school, at after school <laughs> programs. People say that black people don't read and, and reading is not important in our cultural life. And he's like, I've never one day, our company has never been in danger of failing. And he said, the majority of books that we sell, we sell on the African continent and in the Caribbean and Europe. Oh, wow. It was really, like, it was, it was so, so deep. So I've got people like that in my life who are like me. They're book people. They're writing people who just, um, and they're sneaky people. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Who know how to win. Mm -hmm. That's what inspired me to teach. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. amazing. Thank wow. you. Thank you for sharing that. Especially, yeah. and it gives us a little insight into you, you know? So, mm -hmm. thank you. That's amazing that you have that connection to you. I'm actually reading The Water Dancer right now. So. See? See? I mean. See? <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, so that's so cool. So, we're very interested in all of your research, and obviously you're talking about what inspired your teaching career, but we were wondering, what was the... Um, the moment that you got really interested in some of your most prevalent research topics like um, diaspora and then also feminist um, pedagogy. Like what was the moment where you 
decided that those were the subjects that you'd really like to go deeper into? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for that question. So I was raised by activists. On my mother's side, they were housing activists um, who were responsible for Black people being able to integrate public housing in Long Island, New York, after decades of sustained protest. Mm. Uh, my mom used to tell these stories about how before they won, like the Black people who lived in Long Island lived in like shacks. I mean, they just lived in terrible, 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 terrible housing. So I was on my mother's side. On my father's side, they were third world leftists. And my stepfather left um, Haiti, where he was from, to escape the Duvalier regime. Um, they were doing things to activists like my stepfather, like putting them in coffins for two weeks at a time, mm -hmm. like to try to just kill and just torture and frighten people. So he left um, and was able to escape uh, Haiti and his whole family came with him and then he moved to France and was able to pursue his education at the Sorbonne. So I am not a first generation student. Um, I went to my mother's uh, undergraduate graduation because I was in third grade. Like I took the picture of her walking across the stage. Um, so some of the things that shape my experience and the kind of work that I do has to do with being raised by activists and actually watching them have a process of struggle of trying to become educated themselves mm -hmm. right so um I didn't I didn't come to it like by accident I didn't fall into it I didn't get recruited into it at college um my family struggled for education. They believed in education. They thought education was really important um, and they were not willing to, they were not willing to, um, to have the whiteness and the white supremacy of higher education stop them from getting what they needed because their idea was always like, we're fighting because we are trying to change conditions for our people. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's like, that's why I do what I do. Right, you know? carried down through the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, I get it that that's not everybody's experience, you know, um, but they, there's no way we weren't going to school. There's no way that we weren't gonna be scholarly people. There just, there wasn't any way. <laughs> Sometimes it's just written in the stars, you right. know? Mm -hmm. You gotta go forward with it. That's right. amazing. That is wow. so amazing to hear about your research and then to hear about your life's like work well and wh where that comes from is super powerful. Mm -hmm. um, going into your work, so your most recent novel, we wanted to talk about sort of the inspiration for it, the waste of a white skin, the inspiration mm -hmm. for it, what moments stood out to you in the creative process. And yeah, we just wanted to hear a little bit about 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 that mm -hmm. so ways of white skin is a study about the carnegie foundation and their support for apartheid in south africa okay. and you will hear carnegie as an underwriter on national public radio all the time and their tagline is something about supporting democracy and peace and freedom and not always right um in the earlier part of their history and some people would argue even now, they had their hands all in supporting the suppression and repression of black people all over the planet. Mm -hmm. So um, in the 1920s, the Carnegie Corporation was conducting research and supporting researchers really all over the world, but particularly on the African continent, because their idea was if you want to have a society that has different races in it, you have to segregate them. You have to separate them from each other. You have to have them be in different work categories. One of the Carnegie projects um, that they funded, like somebody, you, you got to imagine somebody like wrote a proposal up for this and then mailed it into the Carnegie Foundation and got money for this. There was a group of sisters in Malawi in the 1930s and they thought that they were gonna get the opportunity to go to school so that they could enter the professions, right? But the Carnegie School, the only thing they were funding were domestic education, like, like learning how to be a proper domestic worker. 
you know, so that's the kind of stuff that Carnegie funded. Well, so the study in South Africa that I was looking at that they funded was called the Poor White Study. And mm -hmm. in it, the Carnegie Corporation had been um, funding research on these people that they, that they called waste double white skin. They were people who were poor and they were white and the Carnegie Corporation all the way here, all the way over here, was like, if there's poor white people, we won't be able to establish and like really maintain white power in Southern Africa. Oh, wow. wow. Um, so I read that study. I found it in the archives and I had nightmares for weeks. I had nightmares for months because um, so much of the language about poor whites and the questions about them reminded me of the really brutalizing words that policymakers had used during my childhood and teenagers about poverty in black communities around the United States. So questions like that were in the study, and these were like actual research questions. People got paid to ask these research questions. Are these people poor because they are lazy? Isn't there something defective about their culture or defective about their, uh, their biology that has led them to experience poverty? There was just like zero empathy. Wow, that's so, awful. No, I mean, it's like it was pretty devastating. And, you know, the nightmares in some ways saved me because they enabled me to reconcile with like having grown up with poverty that was like not at all abstract, but was based on very specific experiences like having shoes that were too thin and getting near frostbite. And, you know, we, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, and winters there are serious. Right, even with climate change, winter there is like nobody's business. You know, it's like snow like this, <laughs> like for real. Uh, not so for out of the realm for us. Yeah. <laughs> real, the real. My mother every winter would like burn her legs carrying pots of hot water upstairs. You know, to try to heat a bath for us. Mm -hmm. But I knew she wasn't like a lazy person or defective culturally or biologically because I had been at her graduation. I knew mm -hmm. that she had earned her degree. I knew that my father had earned his degree. I knew that they were working people. Mm -hmm. And so the myth and the contradiction of kind of the way we were framed as Detroiters, as less than, as not valuable, um, that's the kind of stuff that I was trying to work through and work out in that project. Mm -hmm. These kind of like very public attempts that I took very, very personally because um, the kids at school would talk about us as being from Detroit as if we were not human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's such an important story and so close to home too. Right, I was just gonna say. Yeah, how do you how do you go about writing about you know issues of race and poverty and just topics all across the board when they hit so close to home? Like, is there like an inner struggle that happens when you do that? And mm -hmm. do you have any advice for other authors and journalists who want to go into their communities to study these things? Since mm -hmm. obviously we know when people who experience things firsthand, the information that comes out of that usually is more accurate, but it's also painful for the person doing that. Like, how do you go about um, doing that in your own experience? Mm -hmm. So um, a couple years ago, my friend at UCLA, Mishana Gomen, and I were part of a creative writing project. Um, I had been on sabbatical in South Africa, and I was reading the newspaper here online, and there were these like fire tornadoes <laughs> that were happening, and I was like, what the hell is happening in the United States? <laughs> California is burning. Like, what is going on? You know, and the president. That's like 2020. That's like 2020. <laughs> right. And they would interview the president and the president would say some totally moronic stuff like, if they just would sweep under the tree. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> like, it was mind boggling. So while i was still there i started planning with some environmental activists that i knew here for a creative writing seminar and mishana and i were two of the people who organized along with ngugi watiango and 
a bunch of other faculty members and graduate students who are now faculty members. But we organized this um, workshop because I knew all these people who wrote about science. They wrote about like, um, um, about toxic water in um, the Mohawk land in upstate New York. They wrote about um, the impact of pesticides for gardeners here in Orange County. And what we wanted to do was to practice creative writing. Like what would happen if we took our science instead of writing journal articles, we practice writing testimonials and poems and children's stories and fiction. So in that writing seminar one day, Mishana said to me, she was like, Tiffany, your first language is not English, it's actually writing. And it was like one of the truest things that anybody had ever said to me before. And it was right. Because writing, whether it's writing letters or writing a poem or writing some creative nonfiction like a book, for me, is really where I find my voice. And even though in graduate school, there was like all this pushback for, you know, really against women of color and black women and native women writing about their own experiences and lives. Like they used to tell us that's self-indulgent or that's me search, you know, that's not research, that's me search. Um, even though I worried about being labeled by that, I had to write. It was how I could express my ideas. I had to use writing to communicate and to make meaning of how my life fit into the larger history and politics of everybody in the world. Um, and, you know, I also grew up in a house that was multilingual. So, you know, my stepfather was speaking Haitian Creole and my mom was speaking the King's English and also black vernacular English. And, you know, there were people coming through our family from through our household from all different parts of the world. And so I learned to love accents and I love to hear the way that people say things. Every black creator goes through serious struggles that need to be talked about and they don't always have to be written in the form of a research paper. I think some of the healthiest things to get things out is to do it through art. Mm -hmm. And that's what you do, that's what Sydney does. And yeah, I think it's important work to be done. We wanted to talk about, you You already mentioned it, you took the question right from us, but your new role as program equity advisor. So what does that role entail and why is it so important um, that you have this position at UCI? The equity advisor has two different kind of like genealogies or lineages on this campus. One comes through a National Science Foundation grant for the advanced program which was trying to expand gender equity and make sure that women earning PhDs were not deprived of the opportunities to study and research and have tenure track jobs and get tenure. So the second genealogy, and I say this with all sincerity, comes out of the heart of Vice Chancellor Doug Haynes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I wasn't here when he came here because he hired me but he just had a heart for transforming this place and making sure that there were faculty members who actually give a damn mm -hmm. about Black people. Um, and so he had to fight for that. And he's built this incredible infrastructure, really, that has to figure out how to respond to the false constraints and limitations that were put in place when Proposition 209 were passed. Because basically what Proposition 209 did was it was like, it said, Black people trying to study is a problem. We don't want to hear from these Black people in humanities, in the social sciences, in the arts. We want to shut them down. We don't want Latinx people to be taking these Chicano studies classes or taking these um, courses that teach them about their family history from El Salvador. We don't want them to be able to do that. So everybody after Proposition 209 passed, they said, everybody go into STEM, go into STEM, go into sciences. And the thing about the STEM field is that the majority of jobs, the job market is not in higher education. So even if every single underrepresented minority student graduates with a STEM degree, they're gonna go work for Clorox or Silicon Valley. They're not gonna stay on campus. Mm -hmm. So 
in 2070, the professoriate is going to look exactly like it looks right now. You could have the entire class could all be Latino and all Pacific Islander, and the professoriate will look the same because they weren't actually saying, we need people to stay and do battle here in higher ed. And the folks who do that are in humanities, are in the social sciences, are in the arts. That's why Proposition 209 was so damaging. So what V.C. Haynes did was set up just programs, 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 programs. Okay, the law is written like this. What, what can we do to still figure out how to create pathways that recruit people who will finish their training and stay in higher ed? So that when you go into your classes, your professors, at least a little bit, have more experiences or commitment to students who are the actual student body of the state of California. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, he prodded, he poked, he begged, you know, I'm sure he probably had to threaten some people along the way. And then, I mean, more recently, there's people like Judy Wu and Crystal Tribbett and Tweed Bodang and Tyrus Miller and S. Amare and Jenny Fan and Bill Maurer and Casalucci um, and Indu and Lisa Cornish, who retired some years ago. And they just were badasses. They said, we will actually listen to students of color. We will actually create programs that honor their experiences and we will teach them. And um, I'm just down to be in the struggle around that. I'm really serious about making sure that people don't get denied the opportunity to study what they came here to study. Right. That's amazing. And that is so, so, so powerful. In some of our previous episodes of Welcome Table, we have discussed the power of a Black mentor and the power of a Black educator and like this realm of study, like in terms of, you know, students and when you come to college, like sometimes that is your first black professor, like seriously, uh, for Tatum and I. Yeah, that was the case, right? I yeah. had my first black professor this quarter, actually, John Marillo. And you're a senior? Yeah, I'm a senior. That's a damn shame. It is a damn shame, <laughs> exactly, right, exactly. So even having this show and being able to talk to black educators and like be able to actually, you know, be empathized with is so powerful as mm -hmm. a student. So that's why your role is in extremely important, mm -hmm. um, especially for creating space like we were talking about during this um, interview for black students, for black creatives. That's incredibly important right. because if we're just like another like pog in the machine, then we're not really getting anything done. But having people within the humanities who you know, come from experience and are able to inform mm -hmm. these issues that we've been talking about is extremely important. And that's being fought against for a very um, transparent reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your role. I think it's very important. It's just encouraging to talk to yes, you. Yes, it is very encouraging to talk to you and to hear someone actually say, I see you, you know? Um, Going, going, it's hard to come from that, but going, going from that, we want to ask, so um, what are some of the ways that you're able to create space for your students through your work and your new role? Like examples, I suppose, for a, like maybe an incoming black student. Yeah, so, okay, so there's a program, I told you before that I do this work with the medical school and it's called LEAD ABC and it echoes a program um, called Prime LC. Um, and so LEAD ABC is uh, National Institutes of Health funded pathways program to increase the numbers of black students in the medical school because for its entire history, they'd never had more than like two black students in any cohort for its entire history. So like you have like thousands of people being trained and they could only identify two black students. Okay, so. Crazy. Uh, the, I know it's ridiculous. So um, LEAD ABC is LEAD African Black Caribbean and Prime LC is Prime Latino Communities. And so Prime LC had been going along for a long time and they were trying to increase the numbers of doctors who both were interested in dealing with 
like as a career, like imagine being yourself right now, I'm applying to medical school and in my application, I say, I am willing and interested in learning about the public health disparities that are faced specifically by Latino communities. And I want to be trained in that in medical school because I'm going to go work in a community where people really, I'm going to go work in Fresno. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go work in Vallejo. Mm-hmm. Right. So the students who come and lead ABC make that commitment too. And lo and behold, when you allow students to self identify and say, yes, I'm black. Yes, I'm from the Caribbean. Yes, I'm African. You know, my parents are from Nigeria. When you allow them to say that in their application, right, our numbers went up. So all of a sudden, this cohort has a dozen people, some of whom are of African descent and some of whom are not but who have made a lifelong commitment, right? With their training to work in communities and make sure to deal with the public health disparities that are killing people of African descent. So one of the things we did is we organized an orientation training for the lead ABC cohort and some of their faculty. We brought African-American studies faculty from humanities, and then we have a really good ally um, and Professor Michelle Goodwin at the law school. And we did a day long orientation where we talked about the history of uh, medical plantations, right? We talked about some stuff that folks in humanities, this is like totally easy for y'all. We talk about this all the time. That's like in our classes, we talk about this, right? Um, We talked about the history of all of these medical colleges across the US South that all of their anatomy training was done by like excavating black bodies, like stolen black bodies from burial grounds. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the implications of what it means to have that history and what what you have to do to navigate that as a black MD. Right. Mm -hmm. So we do programs like that. There's a training that we developed with an outside company that's like a life theater interactive training that's specifically about what happens to Black undergraduate students when they bring up the Black Lives Matter protests in class? Mm -hmm. And everybody kind of deflects and pretends like it's not part of the subject, even if they're in a class that's on social inequality and injustice. Right. You know, so we have developed this training and I'm working with professors in composition and academic English and Hume Corps to offer that training in courses, Mm -hmm. right? like this academic year, this academic year. So those are some of the kinds of things that we're doing. Like the philosophy department, um, S. Amare, she founded a research center and institute called ACRE, A-I-C-R-E on campus. It's the Africana Institute for Creativity, um, Recognition and Elevation. She and I, I'm on the board for her research institute and she and I were sitting down and said, well, what should we do for this year? And she says, Tiffany, we have to work with the philosophy department. I reached out to Annalisa Koliva, who's the chair, and she said, yeah, we have a really hard time in this department talking about Blackness, about African philosophy in our curriculum. We don't do that. Mm-hmm. We don't know how to do it. We don't know how to hire people well. We don't, we don't address these issues at all. And so I said, well, hey, before you get in the business of trying to hire a bunch of people, what if I bring to you um, the head of the Pan-African Philosophy Association of the Nordic States? This brother has done all the research on all the Black people in Norway, Sweden, all them folks. What if I bring to you the Black woman who founded the Collegian of, of Black Women Philosophers? What if I bring to you the brother who founded the organization of Azanian philosophers, that's the Southern African um, philosophy organization. So people of that caliber are gonna be giving lectures to the faculty, uh, lecturers, and the graduate students in that department because we wanna train them so that they have a different kind of vocabulary so they can themselves say, you know what? I learned something in this lecture. I think I can probably help with a hire. I can write a, 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 we are looking for a professor of Africana philosophy that does such, 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 and such. But I wanted to make sure that the colleagues had information because I don't want to recruit people to campus that are treated in ways that are actionable. 
I want them to be able to hire people that they know how to evaluate because somebody else has taught them what the work is about and its relevance. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's huge. That is yeah. huge. It definitely goes beyond performative activism. What you're doing is like, it's real, it's mm -hmm. tangible, and it's not just like putting a, a diversity sticker on something that's so toxic mm -hmm. from the inside. Right. It's truly an internal process. Mm -hmm. You, know? you got to clean up the inside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You got to deal with the problems happening here. We got to deal with the problems here. Right. And then we got to compel each other to, to do something different when it comes to who we expect to be on the campus. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, our final question will probably be, what are your personal hopes for the future? And this doesn't, I mean, I know that question is very large, but it doesn't have to be like just your professional career. It can just be maybe the future for UC Irvine, the future of African-American curriculum, or just, yes, just tell us like, what are your hopes? Okay, so like in terms of the future of African-American curriculum, um, for a really long time in African-American studies, people had switched their focus I'm talking about faculty members at PWI institutions, not faculty members at HBCUs and campuses on the East Coast. Okay. But perhaps it's because of the context of Proposition 209 or the kind of very anti-Black multiculturalism that's so predominant out here in California. But the faculty really wanted to focus only on their research and not on activism or community-based research or community engagement. They were very hesitant about doing that because it's hard to get tenure if you're also doing community-based research and your colleagues think that's not important. It's hard to get full professor if your audience is um, podcasts and Black Twitter. And so people were really disincentivized and even punished professionally for doing work that is the reason why we came here in the first place like to create you know, be the intellectual arm of the revolution right that's really why most what most of us are motivated by right um and so you have to make these really hard decisions to like do that work anyway even if you know your white colleagues look at you or put their nose up or if your black colleagues are like, that's not a book, that's not important scholarship, right? Mm -hmm. So I guess one of the things that's been a welcome thing that I can imagine being developed more is many more, many more young black scholars um, are coming to the professoriate who are both excellent in terms of their writing and research and publishing books but they're also incredible activists and they also do community-based and community-engaged and community-led and community-centered research. Um, and that has been really beautiful to behold. So when I think about like the future of African-American studies, I think about my colleagues who come out of ethnic studies at San Diego, where the scholarship is like, it's excellent, it's extraordinary. And their work is really grounded in community-led practice and community-engaged research. The other thing that I'm doing is looking forward to a project that I've been um, part of for like the past 15 years. Um, when I first got my first tenure track job some years ago, um, one of my uncles reached out to me and said, you know, I've been holding this land that, um, is the land that your grandparents lived on. And it's the, it's the land that my grandmother was raised on and her parents in Honeyapath, Path, South Carolina, um, land that has been in our family since like the 19, 19 teens. Mm. Oh, wow. um, and so each year when I would get my tax refund, I would put a little bit of money towards improving the land. So I'm building, um, a place like the Highlander Center um, in Honeyapath, Path, South Carolina, where my family is from. Um, the Highlander Center was a historic organizing and training center for activists. So people like Septima Clark, um, who's known as Freedom's Teacher, 
taught movement people there, right? Dr. King was taught about organizing at the Highlander Center. Mm -hmm. So because I come from movement people and because I was raised and like literally fed by people who were exiles from South Africa, um, because I was a hungry child, um, it's literally my duty to fight for my freedom. It's my duty to win. I must love and support all beings and I have nothing to lose but my chains as the miraculous Asana Shakur taught all of us, you know? So in my future, there's more spaces for us to do the work of organizing. Cause make no mistake, our two options of being young black girls who one day can become like Kamala Harris or one day can become like Amy Coney Barrett, those are not the only options we have. Mm -hmm. Those are not our only options. As incredibly competent and brilliant and accomplished as those two individuals are, there's a whole world of other options that we have mm -hmm. yeah. to know about and take up, mm -hmm. right? And you all are doing that, Sydney and Tatum, right now. You're creating other options for us. So in my future, people like you are in positions like the Supreme Court and running for the presidency and the vice presidency. Because I, I, I believe in your hands. Wow, I'm like, I'm so flattered. <laughs> Thank you so much. Not flattery, it's not flattery, there's work to do, girl! <laughs> yeah, there we go. <laughs> yes, yes, thank there. you so much for that and this conversation. Yeah. And just, it was very, very enlightening. So I enjoyed this very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Thank you for all of the knowledge you shared and for what you do. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. All right. Thank you so much for watching this episode of The Welcome Table. And a special thank you to Tiffany. We enjoyed that conversation so much. Um, we will catch you guys next week for our next episode. But in the meantime, this has been Tatum and Sydney. And we will see you next week. Bye, guys.